Thank you for watching this video from the Center for European Studies at Carleton University. This project has received funding from the European Union and Carleton University. The views expressed in this video do not reflect those of the European Union or the Center for European Studies. My name is Krina Bijou and I'm the academic coordinator of the center. Uh, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Hang Dao Su. Uh, it is, uh, we are very happy to have you. Uh, it's very rare that we get the opportunity to host somebody from a youth center, uh, from an Asian youth center. So this is really a very uh, happy moment for us and I hope you have a good experience here in Canada. Uh, it's the first time when Dr. Su came to Canada. So, um, and he tried the poutine. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, Dr. Su is a professor in the Jean Monnet Chair at the National Taiwan University, uh, and also he's a Director General of the EU Center in Tau Taiwan. He's a member of the Council of Jean Monnet Foundation for Europe, um, and his research is mainly focusing on regionalism and integration and comparison of uh, the Asian integration with the European Union integration which is exactly the topic uh, that he will speak about today, which is titled Competing Models of Asian Integration in Light of EU Experience. So please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Su. Uh, thank you, Karina, for the wonderful introduction. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my first visit to Canada, and uh, I just spent three days in Halifax, and, and uh, it's my fifth day and last day for this short visit. Uh, in the past five days, I, I, I enjoyed some cultural shocks. For example, yesterday, I was advised by the student Brent uh, to taste the poutine. And I suppose that's a British poutine. And I, I was waiting for a dessert, but then it's a big quantity of fries. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, so, but it was good. Um, and now I just, I, just, I just found a second uh, surprise because the students seem to keep a large distance from the speaker. <laughs> and and uh, I suppose that's uh, something just in Asia, but suddenly I found it's worldwide uh, among students. <laughs> but I have to share with you a really an experience. And while I gave speech in China, on mainland China, the PRC, that was not the case. When I gave the speech there and uh, students just try to occupy the front seats as near the speaker as possible. They are very aggressive. So that was very impressive to me. And uh, um, so I don't know whether you would like to move a little closer to me, and that will be extremely welcome. Okay, so it depends on you. I'm Taiwanese and with nationality Republic of China, so I'm also Chinese. Um, I started to work on the European Union, European integration, more than 20 years ago. My first topic was focused on the Polish democratization in the 80s, in late 80s and 90s. And then I got the chance to go to France. So I spent years in Europe, including four years in France, one year in Germany, one year in Great Britain, and half a year in Switzerland. That's some very exciting moment. I was attracted by European integration, uh, the study, because quite often I found uh, in international study, international relations, the most difficult thing is reconciliation, which is extremely difficult. Inter two individuals is not easy, even between two individuals, and let alone between two nations and two peoples is extremely difficult, but it's extremely important for the peace. So that's why I was extremely attracted by the European experience, Franco-German reconciliation, German with neighbors, East and West Europeans, and et cetera, newer newcomers and old Europeans, and et cetera. For me, it's a big success so far, though they always encounter a lot of problems and challenges. But the view from Asia is very positive about the European integration because Asia is a continent without integration, without a reconciliation. That's the problem that we are suffering now. And today I will talk about subject to introduce, to explain what has happened and what is happening about the Asian regional building process. And I will analyze that from the, with the reference of European experience. So the whole speech will be divided into uh, mainly four parts. 
The first, just to just show you Asian regionalism, the history. And then I will present an analysis of the five competing approaches favored by different countries toward Asian regionalism now. And then I will focus principally on rise of China and its impact on Asian regionalism. And then I personally um, try to establish a model to evaluate uh, the future of regionalism in the world, principally Asia. And then I will end the speech with some prospect or uh, some prediction of future Asian regionalism in the coming years. Perhaps before, I would like to say that could be the Asia. But I don't know whether you have another def definition of Asia that is different from this geographic Asia. So that is interesting because we use quite often some terms without a clear definition. We call European, Asian, but we never know the borders of those, those terms or those continents. I can show you some definition defined by important organizations or powers. That is political, uh, political map, and that is the definition by European, uh, United Nations Office Secretariat General. Uh, very interestingly, United Nations never publish any maps called Asia, but they publish maps called East Asia, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and the Middle East, and the Southern Asia. So that five puzzles could be composed into one concept of Asia. But interestingly, this Asia, from viewpoint of United Nations, is without the Siberia, as you just mentioned, without Siberia. And that is an, the imagination of the UN Secretariat General. But this is an, in terms of Asian Development Bank, uh, created principally by Japan and the United States under the framework of United Nations. This Asia is smaller again, but it's a little enlarged toward the South Pacific. If you take a look, in, take a look at the membership of this um, Asian Development Bank, some Pacific islands are part of it. So we can say that is Asian defined by United States. So for United States, Middle East and Central Asia should be excluded, but those pro-American Pacific islands should be part of Asia. And that is Asia Pacific, of which Canada is part. And that is definition presented officially by European Union. That is a very small Asia. But today, I would like to say this is the Asia agreed by East Asian people. That is by Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, Southeast Asia, and etc. So today, when I talk about the Asian regionalism, that is the sphere where re Asian regionalism is happening. That is in East Asia plus Southeast Asia and uh, Southern Asia. And this Asia stops at Pakistan. Outside of Pakistan, that is Middle Eastern. Outside of the west part of China, that is Central Asia. Central Asia could be part of the so-called Eurasia. So today when we talk about the Asian regionalism, that is Asia that I will, be, I will mention. And that is uh, uh, some statistics about Asia. Perhaps we just go back, okay. Uh, Asia is the biggest continent, okay? That is the largest Asia and very populated continent. And totally, Asia at large has 47 unities, 47 entities. But when we talk about the Asia polit into political definition, you can see here we have China as the biggest in terms of land, population, etc. In terms of GDP, Japan is just after. And we have another power is India. But pay attention to Asia as a whole. Asia as a whole, the GDP is similar to one India. It's similar to one India. So we can say in Asia, in this Asia, we have four pillars. Japan, China, India, and the Asia as a whole. And inside ASEAN, uh, the 10 countries could be divided in two groups. One we call the continental ASEAN, with Vietnam as the potentially leading power. The other we call maritime ASEAN, with Indonesia as the leader. 
That is why the headquarters of Asian uh, Association for Southeast Asian Nations is located in Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. And another uh, very interesting is that Asian countries like to keep U.S. dollars in hands. So some Asian countries are among the top holders of foreign reserve in the world, with China on the top, followed by Japan, Taiwan, Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, India. So that is something very special in a region, that in this region, a lot of countries like to keep the U.S. dollars in hand. Even it's devaluated, but we still keep it in hand. Okay. There's some reason I'll be explain later, but that is a phenomenon important. So that means we could be the, we could be the really the, uh, the, 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 the loner of the U.S. because we got a lot, of, we get, got, got a lot of money from the trade with the U.S. with the world, but then we give the money to the U.S. again. We buy their bonds. So that is a, a little circle, uh, economic financial circle between the U.S. and some Asian countries. The third point important to understand the regionalism in Asia is it's a continent filled with the, um, a field with non-democratic countries, non-democratic regimes. And according to the Freedom House um, in the U.S., uh, the report last year, only seven countries in the whole Asia and uh, six countries in the East and Southern Asia are qualified as democracy. That is Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, India, Mongolia, plus another is Israel. But totally we have 47. So that means 40 others are non-democratic. So when we look at the, the regionalism in Asia, we have to understand majority of the countries are not democratic. They are authoritarian or the last communist regimes. The last communist regimes are four, Cuba, Vietnam, North Korea, and China. Three of them are located in Asia. Okay. Another point is this political system. Uh, here you can see the purple, uh, purple line and the blue line, the light blue line. The purple line indicates American alliance networking from Japan to the Middle East. And the blue, the light blue line indicates the main oil trade route from Middle East to the East Asia. So evidently you can see that uh, American has already constituted a good networking to contain Chinese military rising. And this alliance is in parallel with the oil trade route. So that means the oil trade route is totally under supervision of American military power from Middle East to Japan to China. So that is an important political system in Asia. And Asia is also a continent filled with the potential conflicts, uh, military conflicts, from Korean Peninsula to South China Sea and to Middle East. But here, the most important now are three points. Korean Pen Peninsula, East China Sea, and the conflicts between Japan and China, uh, to a lesser degree with Taiwan, and South China Sea involving more than six countries, leaving alone leaving a let, let alone American and European. And another point, Asian countries, majority of us are still suffering territorial disputes with neighbors everywhere, everywhere. So that is very different from North America, from Europe. That means the territory are not fixed for a lot of countries. And that could constitute an important source of conflicts in the future. For example, Japan has territorial disputes with Russia, with Korea, with all the neighbors, with Russia, Korea, China, Taiwan. And we have this with, uh, with Japan, with the Philippines, and Philippines had this with Malaysia, and Vietnam has this with China, and Cambodia has this uh, territorial disputes with Thailand. So 
territorial disputes are a serious challenge to peace in Asia. So that is background. Uh, that is the example to show how complicating this territorial dispute could be. You can see that the South China Sea, which is an important crossing area of international trade between Asia, Oceania, and Europe. But there we have six countries that claim different lines of the territory. Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, Vietnam, China, Taiwan. Everybody have different lines, but majority of lines are crossing each other. You can see different colors indicate different claims, so they are overlapping with each other. That means conflicting. That means conflicting. And the last point is in Asia, majority of countries are young nations based upon old civilization. That is a very contradictory combination. That on the one hand, we are very old. On the other hand, we are very young. So here is a chronology to show the birth of the modern nations in Asia. The first modern nation in Asia was born in Japan in 1860s, when Japanese Meiji period transforming, transformed Japan's old system into a modern system. Before that date, in Japan, there was no concept of Japanese. The concept existed only among people from Tokyo. I'm Tokyo. I'm Tokyo East. You are Osaka East. We don't like each other. And you are from Kyoto. Kyoto is an old capital, so more cultivated people. Their Japanese is perfect. Oh, in, the, in Tokyo, what accent? That's traders. That's business people. So, and Hokkaido was not part of Japan at that moment. So at that moment in Japan, Japanese, the concept as a nation, did not exist. The same thing happened in Korea, in China. In Korea at that moment, there was no concept of Korean. They had a concept of people from Seoul, people from, uh, people from Kyangshu, people from Busan. In China, it's more. It, it was a period of dynasty and empires. In China, that was an empire. In Korea, that was a dynasty. In Japan, that was a dynasty controlled by warlords. So, the, and in Vietnam, it's more complicated because there was no Vietnam at that moment. So, the new nation, the modern nations, were created very late, less than 200 years. And the Chinese nation was born in 1911 only, less than 100, only 100 years. And the real Chinese nationalism, that means national feeling, was born during the World War II. That was only during the World War II that the concept that we are Chinese, we belong to the same nation, was born. Before that, the concept was very weak. Very weak. I'm from Beijing. I look down to people from Shanghai. And people from Shanghai did not like people from Guangzhou, barbarian in the south. Okay. So the, the nationalism was still very young. Because it's very young, so it's still very energetic. Because nationalism, and you can see Thailand that was late, that in 1930, 1939, and then after the war, that is the independence of the majority of Asian countries, from Korea to Indonesia to India to Malaysia to Myanmar, and Central. So that is, we are young nations, so our nationalism everywhere is very strong. A good indicator how to evaluate the, national, the degree of nationalism in a country. That's a big challenge for me. The best way is to look into details of the textbook of history in high school. Because that represents the mainstream interpretation of your past and your relations with your neighbors. And in Asia, in Japan, in Korea, once I did a research on this, in Japan, in Korea, in China, in Taiwan, we still have very, very nationalist interpretation of history. When we talk about the success of economic development in the six, since the 60s, we always focus on the 
good quality of people and uh, the wise leadership of the country and uh, uh, the excellent uh, policies of the president, the prime minister, and a very hardworking laborers and, and a very energetic uh, entrepreneurs and a very good education system, etc. That was part of the truth. But for me, the precondition of the success is the support from the U.S., including the money, including the openness of its market, and several, but which was not mentioned in the textbook. So for me, that's a signal of nationalism. So we are a young nation, so nationalism is still very strong in Asian countries. What is nationalism? According to me, nationalism is one nation, one language, one culture, and hate your neighbors. That's important. Why hate your neighbors? Because he or she could be very similar to your, some of your people. So you have to hate it and to justify your nation building. So everywhere, neighborhood is the most difficult relations for individuals and for nations. So that is an, another way. So, okay, last point before we go into the details of regionalism is this. Do Asian values really exist? It was presented principally by this um, statesman in Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, in 1990s. He said that we Asians are different from you Westerners. For example, we put emphasis on community, on order, on consensus process, and we like working, you don't like, and we put emphasis on order, but you put emphasis on liberty, and etc. That's a de big debate in Asia, no consensus. Some say, yes, we have some values, but some say, no, we have some values, but we still have some general values shared, shared with others. I belong to the second. I suppose that the, all the regions have their regional values, but above regional values, we should have some universal values. But we are, in a, we are still in a debate. Okay. So now we talk about integration in Asia. Uh, compared to European integration, we have to know Asian integration is a movement without a strong institutionalization. It seems that Asian people do not like institutionalized regional cooperation. They prefer the cooperation without the strong institutions. And the second, Asian integration is a movement without any supranational, supranational inspiration. We prefer intergovernmental cooperation. And it's an integration without a strong regional identity. We Asian is very weak, is very weak. And uh, uh, that is a political understanding that in Europe, the integration happened principally among the pro-American allies. If we look at the enlargements of European Union, we can see that the first enlargement will be NATO, followed by that of the EU. But that is not the case in Asia, principally because we have China, we have India. Okay, and now we go to the history of the Asian regionalism. Um, I divide that into four periods. Before World War II, Asia was under control of the regionalism, of the colonialism, principally the European empires, France, uh, Netherlands, principally Great Britain, United States, another one was, in, it was Japan, a col another colonial power. At that moment, somebody as a pioneers, they presented the ideas of regional integration in Asia. The first is the founding father of modern China, Sun Yat-sen. Uh, he presented the idea in Kobe, in Japan, because at that moment, Japan was strong and China was weak. And he already foresaw some danger of the future military conflicts and the wars between Japan and China. And he found some negative development in Japan toward the militarism. So he tried to persuade the Japanese leaders 
to stop that trend and adopt regionalism and to launch the Asian cooperation and to permit Japan to, the lead, to be the leader of Asian regionalism and to help other Asian peoples to be prosperous and modernized. But unfortunately, this advice was not adopted by Japan. So Japan went to the militarism and launched the World War II. And then during the World War II, very similar to Nazi Germany, Japanese fascist regime presented the idea of Asia to justify its aggression toward neighbors. Uh, the discourse is as follows, that we Japanese come to your house to help you to liberate you from the West. But that's not true. You cannot go to the house and fire it and kill people and say that I help you. It's not true. Unfortunately, until today, some extreme right parties in Japan still adhere to this thesis. I remember when I was in France, one of my Japanese classmates in class advocated this thesis. That infuriated all the people. He said, no, we went to China to help Chinese, to liberate the Chinese from the white. Oh, that's terrible. That was really terrifying, everybody. But that is still exists. So that is the concept of Asia manipulated by the Japan military leaders and fascist regime during the war. And they, add, they launched the idea greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere with Japan at the center. After World War II, we saw some development of Asian regionalism with the creation of Asian Development Bank in 1966. That was the beginning of the first Asian regional organization in history and followed by others. The red one indicates the important ones, important ones. And that is a chronology. And now the most important one could be the TPP with the US and RCEP with China and the ASEAN at the center. And I divide that period after World War II into four periods. The first period for 20 years, it was Japan that was the leader of this originalism from 1960s to 1980s. Late 1980s, we found two uh, co-leadership, that is US and Australia. That is quite often Australia presented the idea, but supported by the US. But the presenters were Australian leaders. And then in 1990s, US seems to be less zealous about uh, to the, for the Asian regionalism, leaving space, leaving the possibility room to the Asian leaders to launch the Asian integration as the most important movement in Asian regionalism in 1990s. And since the turn of new millennium, a newcomer and big player just came into scene, that is China. So since the 2000, China has become more and more active in advocating Asian regionalism until now. Okay, so I just show you that is the important map to understand. Now we have two projects in competition. That is TPP, the red one indicate the TPP led by the US and the blue one indicate the RCEP presented by ASEAN but in reality led by China, that RCEP. Both competed with each other. And that is some five important regional organizations in Asia, ASEAN, uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, APEC, Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation, the Secretariat is located in Singapore, SARC, South, uh, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation with India as the power, ASEAN Plus or East Asian Summit is composed of ASEAN and uh, its neighboring countries. SCO is a Shanghai cooperation organization with China and Russia as the co-leaders. That, that is, okay. Okay. So now I explain a little the competition between the two, between the five. We now have five approaches toward Asian regionalism. Favored respectively by US, Japan, China, Asia, and India. The first is the US approach. 
What does that mean? The two circles, Asian integration and APEC. Okay, so perhaps before answering this question, we have to try to think if the United States will come the rise of Asian regionalism or not. In reality, no. As the only global superpower, the United States does not like any regionalism. So when there is a rise of Asian regionalism, the reaction of the United States is to launch the interregionalism to contain and reorient that, that regionalism. That's a very typical American strategy. Because I'm global power, I cannot participate deeply into any regionalism. Because if I participate here, in here, how could I treat problems there? So America in APAC presented an idea called open regionalism. What does that mean? What does that mean? Who can answer? What is open regionalism? And what is not open regionalism? Closed door regionalism. But there is no such term, closed door regionalism. But open regionalism seems to distinguish this regionalism from other forms of regionalism. What does that mean, open regionalism? The regionalism. Open regionalism indicates that the United States can participate in more than one regional integration project. So I can participate in Asian regionalism, but that will not prevent me from participating, participating in the Latin American regionalism. And my participation in Latin American regionalism will not prevent me from being engaged in European transatlantic regionalism. So that means I'm free. I will participate in any regional movement as I want. But that is a problem because open regionalism means multiple membership. I can participate here, participate there. And this concept could be possible only if this regionalism stops at the building up of the FTA. That means if the regionalism aims to build up a, a tra free trade zone, that is possible. I can participate in this free trade zone. I can participate in another free trade zone. That is not in contradiction. But if this free trade zone is upgraded to a customs union, that will be trouble because customs union will demand the unified external tariff rate, which is impossible for you to keep to participation. Now you have shoes. That, is, that was why the Great Britain had to withdraw from the Commonwealth Customs Union when it joined the European Economic Community in 1973. He intended to keep, but rejected by de Gaulle. So it had to cut these relations with the Commonwealth countries in order to permit it to join the customs union of the European economic community. So when America insists upon open regionalism, that means this regionalism will stop at creation of FTA maximum. No more further integration possible. So that is the real meaning of so-called open regionalism. So that is American strategy. So when there's a regionalism, I try to launch the interregionalist project to contend this regionalism. So that is American strategy. And that is the, here is the Japan. Uh, for Japan, Japan cannot really lead Asian regionalism for two reasons. One is the past. That is a militarist past um, is, is still an obstacle for Japan to be the leader in Asia, even for economic integration. The second is uh, until now, Japan uh, politically is not uh, really a leading country in Asia. And economically, Japan is still not really uh, a country that opens its market to outsiders. 
And that is problem. If you are a market, uh, you are a country always, uh, that always export, ex exports much to others without opening your market, uh, you will be a winner in foreign reserve, but you will not be the leader. You will be the winner, but you will not be the leader. So Japan cannot lead the Asian regionalism except when it is fully supported by the U.S. So I support you to be the leader, and then Japan could be the leader. So for Japanese, the ideal way is on the one hand, Japan could participate in the American-led approach toward Asian-Pacific integration or cooperation. In exchange of American full support of Japan's strategy toward the Asian building process. So that is the ideal for Japan. So that is why uh, several years ago, Japan presented the idea of Asian community to be started with the negotiations on FTA with China and Korea. So that was Japan's idea. And then when it presented, two years later, it decided to join TPP negotiations to support America, to support America in exchange of U.S. support for Japanese projects in the Asian building process. So that is the Japanese ideal process and approach to, toward Asian regionalism. And that is Asian way. Asian way is tripartite balancing power, balancing strategy. Because Asian countries know they are surrounded by the big powers. So individually or even collectively, they could not compete with any one of the outside powers. So the best way is to keep balance between those ba outside powers. Japan, China, Australia, India. So if we follow, we just trace the negotiation, negotiations on FTA launched by ASEAN, you find a cor uh, correlation between each of them. When ASEAN signed FTA with China, immediately it signed the FTA with India. That is a balancing strategy. And then immediately with Australia. And then some with the US, not all. So that is a balancing strategy of ASEAN. Try to keep the three groups of powers outside of the region to balance each other. And for Indian, Indian strategy is more like a neutral country to be the hub of East and West and North and South. So uh, if we pay attention to Modi's recent visit to Japan, we can find that uh, though India is always concerned about the rise of China and wanted to have more cooperation with Japan, US, etc., but Indian never wants to be regarded as anti-Chinese. That is a very important point. So India wants to keep the balance between the two, between North and South, uh, Eastern Asia, and Arab world. And that is an Indian way. And Chinese, I will go to in deep here. And that is two circles integra of integration preferred by China. One we call the RCEP negotiation, including the maritime Asia, East Asia. The other could be the continental integration favored by Chinese to include Central Asian countries. But China launched this two integration with different approaches. The blue circle is more trade oriented and now investment oriented. But the red one is more energy oriented and security and, uh, oriented. Three years ago, China, Chinese Prime Minister then Wen Jiabao presented idea uh, in Central Asia saying that maybe we should think to develop the Shanghai Cooperation, Shanghai Cooperation Organization into a trade, no, trade organization to start, start the FTA negotiations. But that immediately was mitigated by Russian leaders. Because so far, Russian was very afraid, uh, is very afraid of the rise of China and its influence in Central Asia. Therefore, while China, Russia agreed to uh, co-lead Shanghai Cooperation Organization with China, Russia does not want China to launch the economic integration inside the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. 
because Russia itself has launched the, the project of economic integration in the Eurasian community. That is a community without China, but including Central Asian countries. So that is a little two uh, circles of integration preferred by China. So that is an RCEP, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Okay. Okay. So now I go to the conclusion. How to evaluate this project? Uh, according to my research, I try to indicate uh, six uh, indicators in political terms to evaluate the potential of the different approaches to in originalism. Uh, power structure, elite cooperation, sector integration, regulatory power of the organization, normative power of the leading power, historical legacies of the organization and the powers to evaluate which country's approach could triumph in long run. And my very tentative conclusion is that United States is still the best position to lead Asian regionalism, but in the long run, uh, it could lose because uh, that is a, a very tentative uh, evaluation. Uh, because uh, now China is still communist, uh, and uh, it's very difficult for China to lead evident nominally or in reality integration. Uh, so U.S. still very um, strong to lead this integration, but the problem, the challenge is U.S. is always passive, defensive, vis-a-vis -vis the Asian regionalism. It never serious concern to launch the regionalism in Asia. So it's a passive project. Uh, in my opinion, the TPP will not be successful, no. It's really a dream. Uh, it's really a dream, it's a movement, it's something part of the strategy of the U.S. For example, uh, I can say, for example, the pivoting strategy of Washington. Uh, from Asia viewpoint, uh, as Taiwanese, we welcome the pivoting. But the problem is that when we welcome the pivoting of the U.S., uh, then we found the pivoting favored by U.S. is different from the pivoting preferred by Asians. Because the rise of China is more economic, it's more uh, trade-oriented. But the pivoting strategy of the U.S. is too military, is too uh, military-oriented. So when Americans say, I come back, you come back with troops, with weapons, but not with money. That's a problem. We want more investment from the U.S., more trade with the U.S. But no, we don't want more to buy more weapons, but they want to sell more weapons. So that is the different pivoting. So that is the problem between U.S. and its allies. Okay, so the prospect is the first, lacking fast track mandate from Congress and Obama's representation is very low. I don't think that the TPP will be adopted by the Congress. The negotiations on RCEP could be concluded in, uh, next year. Uh, I just mentioned, if you look, if you just count the pages of FTA concluded by different countries, that is a good indicator because the FTA signed by the US, by Europeans, by Canada is always 1,000 pages thick. But the FTA signed by Asian countries could be only 100 pages. Why? Because that is the Asian way. The Asian FTA uh, treaty is always indicated for good relations. That means we are good friends. We are good neighbors. We start to talk, but not once for all. That's just beginning. But for Americans, for Europeans, that's one for all. So 100, uh, I don't, uh, FTA with, uh, with Korea, so 1,300 pages. But, FTA, but, but the economic framework between Taiwan and China is only, it's only 70, 70 pages. And between ASEAN, it's 100 pages. So that's a different way toward FTA. So RCEP could be thinner the treaties, but easier to be adopted. And facing increasing pressure to reform its economy, according to my observation, 
China will be obliged to participate in TPP negotiations and open negotiations on FTA with the EU to stimulate its economy. This development may bring the U.S. and China to negotiate economic or FTA during the coming years, transforming the dualism of TPP and RCEP into a G2 negotiation.